Welcome to the next video in the discrete math video series. And in this, we are, at least uh, at the beginning, going to solve the problem we left off with. And so we are formalizing these propositions. Okay, this, I went ahead and symbolized it using the symbol W. That is not the most important part, but you know, you can, you can choose any symbol you want, but I chose W. And this I chose to be S. It's just a little evocative of the winter summer. Uh, by the way, you know, a lot of times when you do these kinds of problems where you take a natural language sentence and you turn it into these abstract symbols, uh, you, you are meant to give a key. And so you could give a key like W is the sentence. The deer come through here during the winter. And likewise for the symbol S and its corresponding proposition, uh, the, which by the way, it may be worth remarking, the proposition for S would be the deer come through here during the summer. That would be the proposition, right? The value for the symbol or the proposition for the symbol S, right? Even though it's not in the natural English, that's just, you know, natural language uh, often has you infer certain things. But if you were going to write down the explicit uh, full proposition for the symbol S, you have to fill in those gaps. But in any case, uh, so often you have to give this key. I'm not going to bother giving the key. Uh, again, I kind of am going to be skipping liberally and just doing what I think makes sense. Uh, but, you know, possibly your class, if you're taking a class, might require you in every, one, in every instance like this to give a key for what your symbols mean. So just be aware of that. Okay, but, so let's talk. Okay, not during the summer. That's just very straightforward. We, I think, all probably knew that you'd put a negation on the proposition that is being negated. Okay, that's not the hard part. The hard part may be is the phrase uh, or word but. And here you can already see that I have used the symbol that is reserved for the word and. So does and and but mean the same thing in English? Well, clearly no, right? You can even just feel that they must mean something different. But here's the important point. What they mean that is different is not a logical difference. It is a sort of maybe a different kind of semantic difference. Let's be specific. Like, let's just say, what is the difference between and and but? You could say, I'm going to the store and getting milk. But you could say, I'm going to the store, but I'm not going to get milk or something like that. Or, you, you know, think of anything else where there is a certain amount of going the other way. Uh, there's a certain amount of surprise or not what you might have expected. Uh, I want two hamburgers, but not three. Uh, something, right? Like just, you know, uh, uh, but generally seems to communicate a non-logical sort of expression of here's something you might not have predicted from the first part of what I was saying. That's a kind of, that's a meaning. There's a semantics there, but it's not logical, right? It's not having to do with how these things, truth values are acting uh, with the sentence and so on. So, so there is a difference between the word and and the word but, but the difference is not logical, and therefore we actually symbolize them in logic using exactly the same upward wedge symbol. So that explains that. I hope that's clear. On to the second part, so it is not time to leave, so I chose to symbolize it like this. And by the way, the parentheses do matter, because if you chose to write it as not T and S, which you might have uh, done something like that. And by the way, this S does not mean the same thing as that S, which, you know, maybe that's the value of having a key is so that you know exactly what your symbols mean. But again, I'm moving kind of fast and I think you kind of know what's going on here anyway. So, uh, but any, to get back to this point, um, if you wrote it like this, it could potentially mean this, right? Without the parentheses present, it's not clear which version of this you mean. And they and right and those two different propositions say different things, right? This one says it is not time to leave. You could say full stop, right? And also, but we can uh, start getting ready, right? What would this one mean if we inserted the parentheses like that, so that you could say, okay, this whole thing says 
it is uh, time to leave and we can start getting ready. And then we would negate that and we would basically be saying, it is not the case that both of those are true, right? We would essentially be saying that not both are true, meaning one or the other is false. And that clearly just isn't saying the same thing as what this says. And in fact, right, we're gonna start doing truth tables for these complex propositions soon. And you'll see that this one has a different truth table than this one has showing you that they mean different things. So uh, again, right, this is the proposition to write down and indicating your parentheses really is important in this one because there are two genuinely good readings uh, uh, if you didn't write your parentheses, you know, like again, if you wrote it like this, it would be ambiguous which one you meant. And maybe I'll, I'll express that here in the video by saying, well, does that mean this one, which is the right one, or does it mean this one, which is the wrong one? So since this, uh, this is ambiguous and therefore would be wrong as an answer to this question. Okay, let's move on. So now this one says the avocado is either unripe or rotten or both. Now, because of why I say or both, it removes any doubt, right? You might be wondering, do, should I use the inclusive or exclusive disjunction for this? And the fact that I explicitly tell you or both removes all doubt, tells you that the inclusive disjunction is the right one to use. And, you know, uh, so sometimes, you know, by the way, what if I didn't have this? What if I simply left out the or both? Well, then maybe there's, you know, like you kind of do your best. You use your instincts about language and what is being communicated in the English. But uh, it's just a little less clear. And that's just how natural language is, right? I mean, what you're seeing by the fact that if we just left it at this, you, you know, there just isn't a fact about which disjunction is the right disjunction. And that's right. So what you're seeing is that this logical language that we're developing is not the same. It is much more strict and explicit than messy natural language is, where messy natural language is just constantly shot through with ambiguity. And it's unavoidable. But anyway, so, uh, so, but, but so uh, because I do have this explicit instruction, then we know that the inclusive disjunction is the right one for this problem. And then I say that unripe is U, I say that rotten is R, and I just put the disjunction between them. By the way, you might think that maybe I ought to represent this as the negation of ripe and have like some separate symbol for ripe and then negate that. Well, I would argue uh, that that is incorrect because unripe is not the same as the negation of ripe, which you might need to think about for a minute to appreciate. In particular, you can have food, right, fruit that is rotten, and rotten is not ripe, right? You know, ripe means, you know, very ready to eat, basically, or, you know, in that, in that ripe state of the fruit where uh, it's not underripe, it's not sort of overripe or something like that, it is ripe. And, um, and so it's ready to be eaten, and when it's rotten, it is... Uh, uh, neither ripe nor unripe, right? It is, it is in a different and special state of rotten. And so you wouldn't call that unripe, right? So, so in any case, uh, the, you know, what I'm arguing for here is that uh, calling that, you know, calling unripe the negation of ripe is actually technically wrong. Unripe really means something more like not yet ripe, and therefore, just the, the simplest, most easy, uh, you know, obvious way to handle this complication is just to give, uh, you know, unripe its own letter. Um, what's next? Okay, right. And then there is this challenge problem of, uh, you know, the apple is unripe or ripe or rotten, but it cannot be any two at the same time. So uh, if, you, if you wanted to write that as, you know, say, like there's unripe, ripe, and... Uh, what was the last one? Rotten or something like that. So maybe I'll say rotten is T this time. I'm using uh, uh, different letters from uh, the previous thing. In fact, I should probably write this uh, down here so that we've got unripe, rotten, and, or sorry, uh, ripe and rotten. And you might have guessed, well, I just want to exclusively disjoin all of these. But if you 
Uh, and, you know, and in a little while, you'll see how to work out the truth table for a thing like that, and you'll see that it's not quite right. It doesn't, it doesn't get what you want it to be. Certainly this would, right, like if, if you put, like, you know, because like somehow you've got to be, you know, to, to say what this means, you've got to be able to kind of parse it in, you know, one pair of sentences at a time. After all, that's how the exclusive or works as it works on pairs of sentences. And so if you put, like, let's just say you tried to put it like this, right? So you, so you first, right, the first sentence being uh, exclusively disjoined is this right here. And this would be saying that one of these two must be true, but not both at the same time. In a sense, right, that's kind of what it's saying. But I, I guess, you know, maybe just to short, you know, just to get straight to the sort of uh, end of, of why this is wrong, is just imagine that this is true and also this is true and also that this is true, so that in effect... Uh, all three uh, sentences, right? Like, so it is simultaneously all three. It is unripe, it is ripe, and it is rotten. It is all three, right? Imagine, you know, like, uh, you know, like what we mean to say should, should evaluate that whole thing, right? The evaluation of that should come out false if, if we were properly expressing what we mean to express, right? Because this scenario in what we are trying to express should, in, you know, come out false. But if you follow the rules of exclusive or, it would not, which means that this, this sentence must not be expressing what we mean to express because in this particular scenario where our expression would come out false, this thing technically comes out true, so they must be different. And so, right, so this thing is not the thing that we are trying to express. Why does it come out different? Or, you know, like how could we see that it, uh, that it gets the wrong truth value when we evaluate it? Well, think about how uh, if we had true XOR true, we know that comes out false. And so effectively, uh, if you did true XOR true XOR true, then that would be the same thing as uh, false XOR true, right? Because uh, true true results in false. And then this results in true, right? Because false XOR true results in true. So you, you know, this is just an explicit demonstration of how if we took this to be the model of the sentence, if we were saying that uh, you know, the given sentence in the problem here was represented by three XORs, then in this scenario, the sentence should come out false, but it doesn't if you do it that way. So I hope that's clear. I hope that's convincing. Uh, you can't do this one by just putting together three XORs. So how do you do it? Well, the most straightforward way is to simply use your inclusive disjunction and say that at least one of them must be true, right? Either U or R or T. It is either unripe, ripe, or rotten. That if left just as it is, that would allow for all three to be true as well, and we wouldn't have uh, resolved the problem. But then uh, what you can do is tack on that you cannot have uh, U together with any, right, with R. So you cannot have U together with R. You also cannot have U together with T, and you cannot have R together with T, basically enforcing that no two pair can be true simultaneously. So you basically just make that condition, right? Like you assert every part of that condition that is, um, uh, that is expressed by this clause here. Okay, so there is my solution to this part of the problem. Okay, let's move straight into another exercise. So if A denotes the sentence two is even and B denotes three is even, then translate the following into natural English, right? So this is, you know, three is even conjunction negation, or sorry, the two is even conjunction negation, three is even. And so, uh, but I just said that in a very sort of like one-to-one -one translation. Your job in this exercise is to translate the same thing, but do it so that the resulting English sentence is much more natural than that. And so we have this one as well, two, uh, the, uh, the negation of the XOR, and uh, come over here and we have also uh, that uh, th the, you know, three is uh, the negation of the conjunction. Okay, and the solution in the next video.